All right. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Lori. Thank you guys so much for coming today on this very cold and dark Monday evening. Um, we're, welcome to our research as advocacy workshop. This is the second part in our three shot, our three part series um, on advocacy or the advocacy and medicine group. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just get started right now. We're going to start with some introductions. And we'll tell you a little bit about some more general things related to health disparities, get more into the role of research when we're talking about advocacy. The bulk of this workshop is going to be talking about um, doing an activity as we go through how you would actually you yourself design a study. And then finally, importantly, we'll talk about disseminating results, publishing in both scientific journals and like lay media. So first, just to get started with some introductions, as I said before, my name is Lori Zombach. I use she, her, her pronouns. I graduated from Cornell University and now I go to SUNY Downstate where I'm an MS3, a third year medical student. I'm trying to decide between specializing in either ob or PEDS and my advocacy areas are maternal health, queer health and educational equity. Hey everyone, my name's Anne. I use uh, she, her, hers pronouns and I uh, went to undergrad at NYU, and now I'm a fourth year at Cornell, interested in emergency medicine, and my uh, areas of interest for advocacy are diversity in STEM and medicine, and specifically looking at uh, STEM conferences. Hi, I'm Hanna Flaxman. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I went to undergrad at Penn, and now I'm an M2 at Cornell. And my intended specialty is perhaps primary care of some kind, but I'm also considering PEDS. And then in terms of advocacy areas, um, healthcare equity overall, and also LGBTQ health. And so the three of us, as well as a few other members make up the advocacy and medicine group. We're the only student run work group through the New York Academy of Medicine. And we focus on, you know, advocacy and medicine is really in the name. So we use medicine as a form of social justice and we're open to people in all different areas of the healthcare profession, as well as undergraduate students as well. So if you're interested in learning more, we'll have our contact information at the end of this presentation, and I'd love for you to reach out. But before we get to all of that, I'd love to hear from you. So you just heard from all of us, but you can go ahead and either unmute yourself or in the chat, put your name, institution, and pronouns, maybe an area of interest. Um, and if you're up for it, maybe a favorite tradition for the upcoming holidays. So I'll go ahead and give mine. Um, my family's been doing a Friendsgiving with my dad's elementary school friends, um, and it's been going on far longer than I've been alive. I am 24. This is, I believe, the 37th year that they've been doing this, I think. So we'd love to hear from all of you now. It looks like people are, oh, that's true friendship. It is true friendship. <laughs> There's some pretty great pictures of my dad as like with all of his high, like elementary school and beyond friends. It's so funny. And they all now have kids. Everyone who comes, it's fantastic. So don't be shy. You can put your stuff in there. If not, um, no worries. We'll move on in about a minute. Okay, hearing no one, just for the sake of time, we'll move on, but feel free to still drop things in the chat throughout. Um, and now we're gonna get started with just intro to health disparities. All right, so I'm gonna kick off this talk by giving through an example of a way that research can be used to highlight health disparities. So this study was done really recently in this past year, and it was looking at the influence of structural racism, pandemic stress, and SARS-CoV-2 infection during pregnancies with adverse birth outcomes, including preterm birth and delivering small for gestational age. So the way that they did this was by looking at structural racism, which can be measured as social slash built structural disadvantage or racial economic segregation, and also pandemic related stresses such as community COVID-19 mortality and community unemployment rate increase during the time of COVID. And then they also looked at adverse birth outcomes and categorized all these things by zip code. So you can go on to the next page. So you might be thinking, how did they get all this data? You know, something like structural racism seems like this like 
nebulous concept that we might have heard of, but how do you actually really quantify that in a research setting and get down to the like nitty gritty data? So one of the ways that they measured structural racism was just looking at flat out US census data. So this kind of showed the racial makeup of the different areas and neighborhoods so they could see how the segregation pervaded in that way. And it also shows things like people's economic status and employment status. So you could also look at neighborhoods through that lens and see how that might be stratified. They also looked at something called the index of concentration at the extremes. So this is a measure of neighborhood level racial and economic segregation, particularly looking at an extreme form of segregation called spatial polarization. And that sounds really complicated, but basically it was like another study that was done in the past looking at various measures of racial and economic segregation. And then they posted that data online also. So they kind of referenced this when looking at it. As for the measures of COVID impact, they looked at SARS-CoV-2 data from New York, COVID-19 mortality by neighborhood, and they also did COVID testing on their participants. And then finally for the birth outcomes, um, they just got that from the electronic medical record and looked at the patient's preterm birth and small for gestational age outcomes if it was there. So you go to the next page. So their findings from all of this were that structural racism measures and community unemployment were associated with both SARS-CoV-2 infection and preterm birth by neighborhood, but not small for gestational age infants. So I'll just go through this table really quickly. So on the left side, it's basically looking at the neighborhoods that were in the highest quartile of structural disadvantage, so more disadvantaged neighborhoods. And on the right, it's looking at those in the lowest quartile of structural disadvantage, so less disadvantaged neighborhoods by their measures. And they found that among the more structurally disadvantaged or segregated neighborhoods, there were more people who were non-white, there were more who were higher, um, who tested positive for COVID. There were more that delivered preterm and slightly more that delivered small for gestational age infant. However, that number was not determined to be statistically significant. So although this study doesn't really get at maybe why these things are related, it does show that there is a correlation and it does highlight some of the differences that exist between neighborhoods that have more disadvantage structurally versus those that have less. And the study was actually mentioned 42 times in the news. So that shows how these studies that highlight these disparities can really be shown out in the public media. Oh, Laura, you're I muted. You'd think that after three years of COVID, I would know how to unmute myself. So um, now that we've talked about this example of research as a form of advocacy or shining a light on social injustice, I wanted to take you through sort of seeing the ways in which research plays into our society. So we can think about society, science, and technology as forming this multi-directional triangle, right? With society, science, and technology each at one corner, we show that the arrows are going to and from each of them. This seems kind of confusing. I know this is sort of a confusing figure. So I'm gonna give you an example of something that would take us around the triangle. So if we start in the society corner, we can use an example of, we live in a society that values like really rapid communication, being able to have information and communication at the tips of our fingertips. So maybe we're gonna say that that led to the development of you know increased research into computer science and developing technologies that led to creation of smartphones and then smartphones became readily available and then that led to the development of like social media and then that in turn had another impact on society. So you can see kind of through that example how things would sort of go zigzagging across in all different directions in this triangle in a way that society sort of shapes you know what kind of research what kind of science is going to be funded what things are we going to study and then that in turn plays a role back on society. And technology can kind of modify that relationship as well. Another example would be thinking about something that, you know, science might show something, but then society will bring it to light and give more emphasis, and then that will cause more science to be done. And I'll take you through another example of that. In 2018, a few New York Times articles were published on disparities in maternal health. I already mentioned that maternal health is a big priority of mine, something that I look a lot at. So of course, this was the example that I chose. And you may or may not know that the US has one of the high or has the highest rate of maternal mortality in any developed country. And after these New York Times articles were published, and they had a sort of an emphasis on the dis racial disparities with Black women being over three times more likely to die during childbirth than their non-Hispanic white part, um, counterparts. 
So after this article was published in the New York Times, so in like lay media, right, this is not a scientific publication, it caused clinicians and researchers to start taking a closer look at the maternal mortality and at the disparities. So they did things like increasing efforts to decrease the C-section rates, implementing checklists, which are now found throughout many major hospitals, and doing a root cause analysis, which even found that up to 60% of maternal deaths were preventable. So when we think about a maternal death, let's think we're saying, okay, this mother bled out. There was postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, well, it's not enough to just say there was postpartum hemorrhage. Now we need to say, why was there postpartum hemorrhage? Is it because no one checked for signs of uterine atony? and no one was palpating the uterus. Um, so that's something that could be solved in a checklist. Is it because blood wasn't readily available? Is it because there was no prenatal care and sonograms weren't available, so no one knew that she had like placenta accreta? You know, what are the things that actually led to it? What was the root cause of this? And how much of that was preventable? And after all of this studying was done, you can now actually see the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has a huge amount of information now very readily available about obstetric hemorrhages and how to prevent them. Okay, so I'm excited to go on to this next part where I'm going to ask for some participation from the audience. So if you could go on to the next page, please. Thanks, Lori. Okay, so basically, I'm going to walk y'all through the basic process of designing a scientific study that's going to look at some kind of health disparity or health equity issue. So for starters, I will need everyone to put on their thinking caps and put some ideas that they might have or questions in the chat of a, some kind of topic that we could do a project on. So you can think about some problems you might've noticed in the medical world, either in your own experience or maybe from somebody you've spoken to. And you can also think about some literature that you might've read in the past or a community that you've done work with Whatever it might be, you can throw in the chat and I'll help you kind of narrow it down to something that's researchable. Also, if there's a topic that you actually want to do research on, this might be a great time to sort of workshop that idea and fine tune it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and jumping on that, I don't know how many uh, Well Cornell students are here that have their AOC or like dedicated research block coming up, but uh, this would be a great time to put your AOC thesis in there and then have yeah. everyone give some feedback. Okay, great. So we do have one in the chat. So somebody said medication non-adherence in chronic disease patients. So that's a really good question, right? Because if we can get to the root of why patients aren't adhering to their medications, then that might be able to help us figure out some solutions for that, which can help these patients be more healthy. But through the lens of health equity, maybe we wanna look at if particular groups tend to have worse medication adherence than other groups, or those with particular diseases have different medication adherence. So whoever put that in the chat, do you mind maybe specifying a bit more like what groups you wanna look at for medication adherence? And I can help come up with that also if you want. Anyone else is also welcome to chime in, doesn't have to be yes. just one person. Okay, I'll, oh, okay. Great, seniors who live alone not keeping their medical appointments. Okay, African-American males, okay, great. These are all really good ideas. Okay, so we'll go with that. So why don't we say that what we want to look at is medication non-adherence in chronic disease patients for African-American males versus white males, let's say. So we want to see if the numbers differ between those two groups, maybe just to point out a trend and maybe also to get to the root cause of where that might come from. So a way that you can narrow down your focus of a research topic is by thinking of something called your PICO. This is probably something you've heard before, but if not, then basically what you wanna think about is the population that you wanna study. So in this case, it would be African-American and white men. The intervention, so these are more for studies where you're doing something, which is called like a randomized control trial or experimental trial. Not every study has to have that, but if you are thinking of doing an intervention, you would think of that here, and then you'd have your control group, which is what you'd compare it to, and then your outcome. 
So the outcome for this study would be medication non-adherence. And the hypothesis, do you have a hypothesis, whoever put that in the chat or anybody about what these, um, this study's results might be? It's okay if not. So let's say our hypothesis is, oh, the numbers will be the same. And then we actually do the study and we'll see if that's true. Okay, so we can go into the next page. So the next thing you wanna think about with your study once you have your research question and your hypothesis is how you're actually going to do it. So this table outlines a bunch of different research methods that can be used and a couple factors that you might wanna think about when deciding which one to actually do. So on the left side of the table are the descriptive studies. So these are either surveys or general qualitative data studies that generally are looking at a little bit more fine detail about various questions. So for example, um, a study might wanna be interviewing people of a certain population to find out why they have trouble with a certain issue, or they might wanna be screening um, a new tool that's gonna to be used in a medical setting with a group of people that it will be used on to see if they like it, if they're satisfied with it, whatever it might be. And then there's the analytical side, um, which is probably a little more what we're looking at for this study. There's the experimental studies where you basically have your experimental group where something is being done to them. Uh, traditionally, you think of like a drug trial where they're testing out a new medication and there's the group you tested on. And then there's the control group who might not know that they're being tested on, and then you're trying to see if there's a difference between those groups. These studies are really good when you wanna look at cause and effect and specific results. So usually you have some outcome in mind, like improving certain symptoms or curing a disease with that medication that you're really looking for. However, they can be more complex and they can be risky in the case of like, let's say you're using a new medication, you don't really know what it does for everyone. So that can be a little tougher. Then there's the more observational studies. So we'll start by going over what a cohort study is. So these are basically studies where you're looking at one group and you're following them over time. And basically what you're looking for is a correlation between something that the group all starts with and you're looking at what happens over time. So I'll give an example because I think that makes it easier to explain. Let's say you're looking at a group that has fractures in their femur and you wanna see if those people develop arthritis in their hip later on in life. So you would get a large group of people and then you would follow them over time and see which of them develops it. There's the case control group, which is kind of similar, but you're looking at more in the opposite direction. So this one's really good when you have a disease that's rare or a small population where it's hard to find people to do the trial. So you start out with the group of people who have that disease or whatever predisposing condition it is that you're looking at. And then you either ask them or you look backwards through their medical record to see if they might have had some other thing in their past that predisposed them to then get that condition. So a little similar, but one of them was for bigger groups and one's more for smaller groups. Finally, there's a cross-sectional study where you're collecting data all at one point in time. So this can either be done through a survey. So let's say you give out a survey at a clinic to a bunch of people and they just fill it out once and then they give it back to you. So that's just like one time point you're getting that data. Um, you can also do something called a chart review where you're looking through a patient's electronic medical record to see how many of them have a certain disease or how many of them came in at a certain time with a certain complaint. And the reason that this is good is because you can do it really easily with limited resources. Um, and it's very safe and simple for the participants usually. However, it can be harder to look at cause and effect since you're kind of just looking at one time point and not like really getting at the reason why those things might be connected. So that was a very long an explanation, but which of these do we think would be the best for this study? We wanna look at how patients are adhering to their medication for those with chronic disease. So we wanna think about, is this a large or a small patient population? And then what is the best way to measure non-adherence? Yeah, I was actually interested uh, in that myself. So I, I think, is it like Marie Cloud? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've talked up or like have thought about how you're measuring medication non-adherence. I think that's like a really great topic. Yeah. 
and anyone can answer. Yeah, I'll start off. So I think that if I were designing this study, I might start with something more qualitative. I might do a focus group or key informant interviews and actually ask patients like, how do you think, you know, how do you keep track of your medications? What are the barriers that you think are preventing you from accessing either medications or appointments or whatever it is? And then maybe from there, let that guide whatever experimental or analytic study I wanted to do. So if it kept coming up in conversation that people were saying, oh, it's because of my insurance or, oh, it's because I don't have food to take the medicine on. I can't take the medicine on the empty stomach, whatever it is, then maybe that would be the thing I would study next. Yeah, that's a great descriptive kind of take on the study. Yeah, I think another way, if you want like big data sets, um, although I don't know how feasible this is, but just partnering either with pharmacies, because they will obviously have a record of who's picking up their medications. Um, although I don't know if you could get what the chronic disease that they're picking it up for. I mean, yeah, I don't, maybe that wouldn't be, you wouldn't get enough information from that. Um, or per partnering with uh, nursing homes. Although again, you're like narrowing down your patient population to people in nursing homes, but um, I know they keep like very uh, good documentation of all of this. Although again, they would probably adhere to the medications in a nursing home since they're pretty <laughs> well No, these uh, are good ideas. Yeah, it was very interesting to think about. Yeah, and something else you can always think about is like self-reported data. Um, obviously, the issue with that is it might not always be extremely accurate. Maybe people don't like remember exactly if, if they took their meds every day, um, or they might just report it incorrectly. But you could always think about just maybe making a survey and asking people, you know, how many days per week last week did you take your medication? But obviously, with studies like that, you'd want to think about the bias that they might have in reporting that data. Okay, any other last thoughts on this or, or questions? If any of that was confusing, I can explain again. Okay, well, hopefully that at least got your minds thinking about the different possibilities. So I'll go on to the last part of this, which is just some other considerations with the methodology of this study. So some things you wanna think about are recruitment strategy. So where you're gonna find the patients for the study, how you're gonna do the data collection. So I think this is something that Lori talked about really quickly, but like how you're actually gonna measure like what medication non-adherence means. That's something that's really important to think about um, and how you're gonna make that as accurate as possible and precise as possible. You also want to think about ethical considerations. So especially when working with groups that might be marginalized or maybe have had historically bad experiences with the research community and therefore might be a little more reluctant to join a study or to trust the research community. You really want to think about that um, when you're working with those populations and how you're going to make sure that your study is ethical and not going to coerce them or make them feel uncomfortable. Um, something else that's important is avoiding bias. Uh, this mostly might make you think about like a randomized control trial where you want nobody to know which group they're in so that they don't report things wrong. But you can also think about things like confounding factors. So let's say for this study, we have the two groups. We have the white males and African-American males. But we might also want to consider something like socioeconomic status because that might also influence that the way that people are able to access their medications. Maybe those who are lower socioeconomic status um, can't afford the medication and that's why they're not taking it. So that might be another confounding factor aside from the racial component. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts on those four topics for this study, feel free to put that in the chat. And then I'll just give a quick note on community collaboration before moving on. So any ideas for recruitment, collecting data, ethical considerations, and avoiding bias or confounders.
So remember, we're going through this as an exercise for adherence and chronic disease patients. So if you have an idea of like how, where would we recruit chronic disease patients? Let's start there. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to drop that in the chat just as a simple question. I think someone had mentioned nursing homes at one point. Is there any other place? Oh, I see someone's in the chat. Primary care, outpatient. Absolutely. Yeah. Primary care. Oh, both people said that. Definitely a great <laughs> to find awesome. um, chronic disease. Nursing homes was mentioned before. Um, I think those are two great ones. Any yeah, thoughts totally. on qualitative versus quantitative data for a study like this? I talked a little bit at the beginning about starting with qualitative data. Um, and then narrowing down from there. I don't know if anyone wanted to, you know, pipe in and add anything to that. Yeah, I think one thing to also think about is just how you define medication non-adherence. Because uh, I think it, it's, if you're asking like how many times in the past week have you missed your medication, if they say, um, you know, six, I've took it six out of the seven days. Is that medication non-adherence? Cause maybe that one day was also just like a fluke. Like, are you, should you even ask like in the past week or should you ask in the past month? And, um, I know that's not qualitative versus quantitative, but yeah, I think the definition of medication non-adherence is also something to uh, consider. Absolutely. And Alexis, to answer your question, um, yes, you definitely could use both. Um, and when we're thinking about how people self-report data, which is, I kind of think this is what you're getting at, um, you know, like people saying that they adhered risk missed medications and then actually verifying if they did or not. Another thing that you can do in addition to cross-referencing cross or instead of cross-referencing would be to include a social desirability scale. Um, and a social desirability scale is something that you add into a research when you think that people are likely to lie or give you like fake information, not because they're trying to be malicious, but because, you know, they don't want to disappoint you or they want to seem better than they are. So an example of this would be that as you're, if you're asking questions that you think, like if you're asking, if you're a medical professional and you ask someone, do you always take your medications? Do you always come to your appointment? Like some people are just going to say yes, even when it's not true, right? Because we all want to have that social desirability. So a social desirability scale is something you could throw into the end of a survey that would ask the question like, you know, you're um, at a store and you hand them a dollar and your, you know, your candy bar only cost 80 cents. But instead of giving you 20 cents back, the clerks hands you, you know, 30 cents or whatever it is. You know, you get an extra 10 cents and then you're out the door and then you realize the mistake. Do you go back and hand in the extra 10 cents? And a social desire, the Billy scale is that kind of question that like, most people honestly would not go back and hand in that extra dime because, you know, that's the reality of our world. But if you keep asking those kinds of questions, the people who ask, who answer like, yes, I would do the right thing to every single question. Maybe a few of those are really, really good people. A lot of them are just giving you the answer that they think that you want to hear. So that's how you can kind of tell if people are telling the truth or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't heard of that before. Mm -hmm. I feel like everyone here now thinks that I'm going around stealing dimes from everyone, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so does anyone have any thoughts for ethical considerations for this study? Also, sorry, Marie Cloud, are you saying that you can't hear us because we're having a sound issue or are you, were you just saying that you want to respond and you were just having an issue with your sound? Can, can people chime in if they can hear? Every, can everyone hear us? I can hear you. Can you? Hear I can me? hear all you guys, so. Okay. I'm gonna, okay. I can hear everyone. Okay, awesome. Great. So Marjorie said consent in native language. Yes, that is so important because if people are consenting to something and they're not fully understanding it, that is very problematic. So definitely important to either have a translator there or have it written in their native language or both. Cultural considerations is really interesting too. I would wonder how maybe cultural differences might affect medication adherence. 
um, maybe if there's different beliefs about Western medication um, or people who might be more inclined to use alternative medication and if that would correlate with any of the outcomes, that's definitely something important to think about. Great, okay. So then going on, uh, sorry, there's another question in the chat. Are there good ways to include those who may not be able to read? That's a great question. So I know that a lot of hospitals nowadays have a system that basically does text to speech. So you can use that to kind of have it read things aloud to patients who are maybe not able to see. Um, so I think that might be a good solution. I forget what it's called, but if anybody knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> there's like a program that reads text out loud. Yeah, there are options to get things read aloud. I'm also not sure what it calls. Um, in that case, if you're having someone who, I don't know if this person can sign, I don't mean sign language, but I mean physically sign a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. If not, you'll need to check with your IRB on whether or not they'll accept oral consent or if it has to be a signed consent form. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a great point. I actually hadn't thought about that if someone can read. Those with little, yeah. So um, in general for consent forms, in addition to having them available in multiple languages, if possible, you never want it to be above like a third or a fourth grade reading level. Of course, there are people who can't even read that. And then, you know, if it's a visual difficulty or, um, you know, if they're illiterate, we have the text-to-speech mm -hmm. options. But even for people who can read like a third, fourth grade reading level, ideally is where we want to be at. Yeah. So I'd say for those scenarios, definitely maybe having somebody read it aloud to them or if they can have like a proxy read it for them, but that would probably be too complicated. So yeah, probably just verbal consent. Great, okay. I don't wanna take up too much time here. So just really quickly, if anybody has any other ideas for how we could avoid bias or if there's another potentially confounding factor that you think might affect the results in this type of study. I think we can move on. OK, all right, great. So I'll just do a quick note on community collaboration. Uh, I think this is also something Lori kind of talked about. But what a lot of studies I've seen doing nowadays, which I think is wonderful, is they'll actually incorporate feedback from the group that they're studying before doing the study or even while they're doing the study. So sometimes before designing something like, let's say an intervention, like a weight loss intervention with a certain group, they'll actually go and consult that group first to see what kind of strategies might actually work best for their lifestyle. And then they'll incorporate that feedback into the design of the study. There's also something called community-based participatory research where every stage of the research process is actually done in collaboration with the community including coming up with the research question, designing the study, and then disseminating the results. So that's also a really great way to ensure that the community you're working with is also benefiting from the study itself. Thank you for doing that workshop with me. Now I think Anne's going to go on with the data. Yeah. Um, all right. So this might be like the part that some of you all dread. And it's important to note that most institutions have statisticians that can help you out. Um, and especially when you're, you know, conducting the research that you're going to publish, you really want to take advantage of the stat statisticians. Um, but in terms of knowing it yourself, it's obviously important just so that when you are reading studies, creating studies, that you are, you feel confident yourself that you're doing it correctly instead of, you know, relying on just the statisticians there. And then for all the med students out there, stat statistics questions definitely come up. Um, on uh, UWorld question, or not UWorld, um, on your shelf exams and your step one exams. So this is just one example, and you don't need to re read like the whole um, stem of the question, but basically there is two groups, group A and group B, both of whom are treated with a drug, let's say, and uh, this is the efficacy in group A and group B. And so what test would you want to run to see if there's an actual difference in the efficacy between these two groups. And you can put it in the chat if you want. I know it's like hard to think in the spot. 
Okay, I'm going to just move on for the sake of time. Um, do you want to click to the next slide, Laurie? So we can actually just work through this. So using this table. Uh, so can, does anyone want to put what the independent variable even is uh, in this study? In the chat. OK. Again, for the sake of time, we're, I'm going to just breeze through this. So the independent variable here is whether the patient is in group A or group B. So this is categorical. The dependent variable is whether or not the drug was efficacious or not. And so this is like typical U-world tricks where they kind of make it look continuous on the graph, but it's actually categorical. So categorical, categorical, and you can use chi-square. And this table is like, I don't know if it's confusing or... Uh, just to clarify, um, regression uh, models are ways of predicting a relationship. So that's like if a patient is in group A, what's the probability of a treatment being efficacious? Chi-square, T-test, ANOVA, those are all tests of significance. So that's just saying, is there a significant difference between group A and group B? It's not, they're not modeling uh, relationships so that you can predict the efficacy of something. It's just is there a difference? Uh, so go to the next slide. Oh yes, that's our answer. Um, oh, sorry, I think it went back. Yeah, uh, one more. Click forward. Okay. Is this what you want? <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> um, yeah, this is what I want. Okay. So, uh, I came up with this sample, uh, another example that we could do just to kind of hammer home the point. Uh, but if we actually, why don't we, we can just do the example uh, that we have come up with. So if we want to see medication non-adherence uh, between African-American males and white males, what test would we want to use? And actually it, it's depending on how, how we're modeling this, it would be the same one. So in this case, again, we have a categorical independent variable, whether they are white males versus African-American males. And then we have a categorical dependent variable, whether they, um, whether they are inherent or not inherent, adherent, depending on our definition. So we would use chi-square again. Do you wanna click forward? Uh, I came up with this whole example. We don't need to go through it, but just so that we can talk about all the other tests briefly. Uh, T-test and ANOVA are when your dependent variable is uh, quantitative. And so that's like, is there a statistical difference in the number of tests run for ordered for English versus non-English speakers? So the number of tests is uh, a continuous variable. And so you can use a t-test if you're comparing two groups, like English versus non-English, or ANOVA if you're comparing three groups, like English versus Spanish versus French versus et cetera. Um, and so that is a brief rundown on just what test you should even use. Statistics is like a very, as we all know, vast category, but hopefully that'll give you at least some confidence moving forward when you pick your analytic, your statistical test. Yeah, thanks so much for going through that, Anne. And sorry for my janky PowerPoint skills over there for a minute. Um, no, so no, now no. that we have created and designed and theoretically implemented our study, run our statistical analysis, now it's time to publish your results. So what are you going to do? Well, first of all, why does it matter? It matters because all research inherently builds upon itself, right? One study can be cited in another study, sparks ideas halfway across the world. Um, and it's important for that reason to be able to communicate with scientists both near at your home institution and far, like I said, halfway across the world. This is important because it can have a huge societal impact. And um, I think Anne's going to talk about this in a bit, that it can have a public interest or policy change. And selfishly, it's also just important to help you build co connections to build your career in the future. So when you think about where to publish, you have two options. You have the scientific community and then the lay media. And when I say lay media, I just mean things that aren't scientific journals. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But starting with scientific journals, because this is going to be sort of the main endeavor of your medical or healthcare professional's you know, career. 
it's important to get your research out there into the scientific community for the reasons I talked about. And when you start, you want to start choosing a journal before you even put pen to paper. And by that, I mean like, you know, typing on your keyboard. And the reason is that you want to be able to tailor things like who is your target audience? What's the scope of this journal? Right. Some journals are super broad, so they might not have people that the readers might not be super familiar with that, like really, really niche topic, or it might be very, very narrow. And so everyone knows exactly what you're talking about because everyone is so well trained in that specific area. In addition to targeting your target audience, you also want to be able to tailor things like what is the word count? You know, how many tables and graphs am I able to include? Um, you know, what is the style of citations? All those little details that sound silly, but they really do matter. When you think about where to publish, some journals can be very competitive, so don't be dissuaded. that a lot of people do um, apply to numerous journals before they're finally accepted into one. So when you think about how to choose your journal, a great place to start is a simple Google search. You can also use this link, which links to a free ebook. It is free, I promise, and I'm not being paid by Taylor and Francis to tell you all of this. Um, and that will help you narrow down your search. You can also ask professors or colleagues at your institutions or a librarian at your institution um, if you have a PI for your project, they're going to have a good idea of where to publish as well, and they can help you out a lot in that process. So once you want to know where you're going to publish, then you want to know how. So different journals will have a few different types of articles, and the major ones are going to be a major article, which is what you generally think of in a scientific journal. Um, but then there will also be things like a brief report, which are going to be things that are a little smaller in scale, maybe for a pilot study, for example, a case report. Um, even a letter to the editor, little known fact, but a lot of scientific journals do have letters to the editors. Some other options you have in publishing your data are going to be to make your data set accessible. There are different online ways that you can do this, and that just makes everything a lot more transparent. And if someone wants to try to reproduce your work, they're able to do that. And you can publish open access. So you may have noticed in trying to do your own online research that sometimes you go to find a journal and you're like, this fits exactly what I need. Like this is gonna exactly answer my question and help me write this paper. And then you see something that says like, you do not have access to this journal, please pay $50. That's very frustrating because we want information to be readily available. We want everything to be nice and transparent and have great communication, but that doesn't always happen. So publishing open access is a way for you as the author to say, I want everyone to be able to access my research without any paywall which is amazing for everyone else. But the problem is that for you, there is going to be a pretty steep price, a pretty high ticket price on that. So it's just kind of the give and take. If you're able to get funding from your institution, I would suggest trying to do that because it's gonna be a lot to pay out of pocket. When you actually go to sit down and write, you're going to write and submit your initial manuscript. You're going to edit this a thousand, thousand times. And I say that, and I wanna tell you this because you as a writer are going to get very attached to the words you like. You're going to be like, that is a great sentence. I'm so proud of myself for writing it. And then you are going to realize that you need to cut that sentence that you love, that is your baby. So it's important not to find too much of an emotional attachment to your sentences because a lot of it is going to get cut. Make sure to format correctly. As I said at the beginning, different journals and different article types will have different things in terms of like word count, what size should the margins be, what font, should your headings be in bold or italics? Like, these are the kinds of silly, silly things that you don't want your manuscript to get you know, thrown out for. And of course, you want your citations to be in the proper style, should it be AM, you know, APA or MLA or whatever. Once you submit, you might initially right off the bat get accepted or rejected, but more commonly, it will be a conditional acceptance or rejection, which means that they're going to say, here's what our peer reviewers thought. So a peer reviewer is a group of people who are educated in this field, and they're going to write down a bunch of comments about what they thought about your manuscript. And then you're going to have to go and you're going to create like maybe a little table. And on one side, it will say, you know, reviewer A said that my paragraph two sentence four, you know, was too vague and didn't comment enough about the limitations of whatever. And then and the next side, the next column of the table, you're going to say, and here's how I address that. Here's all the cha changes that I made. And then you're going to resubmit and then maybe get more comments and then maybe resubmit. And this will go on for a while until hopefully you're accepted, at which point they'll send you a PDF version of a proof for you to approve of. And then finally, fingers crossed, you can hang it on your fridge, send it to your mother, et cetera, et cetera. 
Another option for communicating with the scientific community is going to conferences. This is a great way to meet and network with people in your field. Um, and you can go to a conference with preliminary results. So a lot of people think they have to wait until a study is over to publish. And for a manuscript, that's generally true. But for conferences, you can go even with smaller sample sizes or only preliminary results. A lot of conferences now, because of COVID, have been virtual in the past few years, which makes them a lot more accessible, right? Because there's no traveling, it's less of a time commitment, but it's a lot less social. So it's harder to make really like, real commitments or real connections with people and network in that same way. And your conference can be a poster presentation. So actually, this is a poster presentation that I did about a year ago um, on a virtual conference for Emory. This is my maternal health uh, poster that I did. Um, or you could do an oral presentation. So that will be sort of like a PowerPoint and it will be about 10 minutes and then a Q&A. And then that's all about the scientific community. But I did mention you have some options for lay media as well. So this will be about getting your research out to the actual community who's impacted by the research. So if you go back, I'm going to see that in this poster, I did the effective discrimination on group based medical mistrust, distrust rather. Uh, so I was doing this poster and I was thinking about, you know, when pregnant persons present to prenatal care, do they trust their healthcare providers? Do they trust the institution of medicine? Do they feel like it's looking out for them? And then does that have any, you know, is that predicted by if they had um, experiences with microaggressions? And then, you know, will it have any implications on the decisions they make throughout their pregnancy? So if I think about taking this to a conference, I'm presenting to the scientific community. Um, you know, I'm making a name for myself and I'm writing these papers and I'm getting all this great credit and that's amazing, but, and I'm telling all these scientists about it, but like, what about the actual community of pregnant persons that were served by this? And so this is about getting the research out to those people who are actually impacted and participating in the research. So options would be a newspaper, local, regional, or national. You could write an opinion piece. You could write a letter to the editor. You can also get creative, right? News channels, radio, podcasts, or everyone has a podcast these days. I'm sure you can get on someone's podcast. And then, as I will discuss, we also have policy options. So letters to politicians calling for change could be as narrow in scope as a school policy calling for, you know, healthier lunch options, or as far-reaching as I want to, you know, have national policy about abortion rights, something crazy like that, you know, something on a much wider scope. Yeah, um, so this is kind of like the next step after dissemination. So we talked about how we design a study, how we an analyze it, how we publish it, how we disseminate it. And so this is kind of like that last push of how do we actually get our research to make to translate into policy care, uh, policy change. Um, and so this is like a very, very broad topic. Um, and we're actually gonna have a whole workshop on policy making in the spring, but we thought it was a really interesting topic and wanted to touch on it now. So the first thing that you wanna think about is like Lori was saying, what level of policy do you wanna change? And it's important to note that driving policy changes in the private sector, like if you want to um, drive policy change in your hospital or, um, you know, a private sector uh, body is very, very different than making policy change at the public slash government uh, level. And so in hospitals, evidence-based medicine and research in general is much more impactful and can go much further. So while the hospital board will probably have other stakeholders to consider than just your study, you're still working in a relatively closed system filled with experts in healthcare. Uh, when you contrast this with the government, even on a local level, you're operating in a very complex system where healthcare is only a fraction of the issue that issues that your policymaker is having to deal with. And then your research within that context obviously is a very, very small fraction of the healthcare uh, of what healthcare encompasses. So in government policy, it's not enough to kind of uh, disseminate or tell a policymaker about your research and just hope that that will drive policy change. More often than that, that is, that is not going to happen. They just have too many competing interests. And so you need to be very strategic about how you sell your research. And you need to know about policymaking. You, you need to know the process. You need to know what they're going through in order to actually be effective in getting your research to drive policy change. 
So there's a whole body of research on this and uh, specifically the evidence policy gap, which is the gap between the production of evidence by scientists and its use by policymakers. And so this one paper I listed here is actually a very interesting take on it. So it argues that previous papers done on this topic always kind of argued that the gap exists because of lack of time, support, resources, et cetera, on the scientists uh, part, and also a uh, inability to predict the demand for uh, certain types of research. And so thinking about like the media cycle, it's hard for us to know when research on gun, uh, gun violence versus abortion versus something else will be the most impactful just because this cycle is changing so quickly. Uh, can you go to the next slide? What the authors argued is that all of these are just the tip of the iceberg. And so they said, even if we had adequate time, support, resources, and presented our research at the right time, the research we present still might not be impactful, or at least we're not optimizing the impact it can have. And uh, oh yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the chat too. And, um, and they want to go into all the reasons this might be. And so I'm not going to go in depth into all of these, but basically they're saying that, uh, like I said, we're not considering all of these factors. So the first two are pretty self-explanatory. It's a lack of knowledge from either side of how research slash policy making is conducted. Um, this third one, bounded rationality, is a really interesting concept that um, policymakers and politicians especially uh, usually follow. And so the idea behind it is that th given the number of decisions that politicians need to make and the number of topics that they must know about, politicians usually prioritize uh, decision making based on what decisions are quote unquote good enough, rather than always trying to get the best possible decision. And so for your research, for example, if you're trying to argue that your intervention is should become a policy, the best way to do that is probably not saying that your intervention is quote unquote the best, because uh, how will a politician know that it is actually the best? And so instead, you should argue that your research or intervention is um, will help solve the problem, and most importantly, will not do harm. And so doing cost benefit analysis and harm reduction analysis are crucial parts of your study if you want to optimize it. And so again, this is just a very uh, an example of how you need to reframe your thinking when you want your research to drive policy change. Um, many stakeholders, obviously that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, let's see, shortcomings of research. This is just referring to the fact that our research is often incomplete or conflicting. And so overselling your research, um, you know, it might benefit you in the short run, but in the long run, it's damaging the, the um, people's view on research, because then new research comes out that's conflicting, and then people are like, how can we even trust research? So again, those are considerations. The role of pathos in policy is just referring to the role of emotion in policy making, and uh, specifically emphasizing that it's not a negative to have emotion in policy, right? So if you don't have emotion, and you're just doing this evidence-based method, you can get this very utilitarian approach to policy making, which also can lead to harm. Uh, government niches, referring to the idea that each branch and level of government has its own systems, its own jargon, its own key players. So pitching your ideas to the DOH at the city versus federal level is different. And again, using this to guide your research uh, strategies, is it better to pitch your uh, research to many different uh, government government bodies or to just really focus on one and try and drive change there. And obviously it's better to choose one, get to know the niche, get to know the key players so that you can actually make sure that your research is having an impact on that government level. Uh, and then rapid shifts in attention, we already kind of did, uh, touched on. And so, uh, Laurie, can you just click the next? Okay. Uh, sorry, this is kind of an ugly slide, but basically there we're going to go, there's ways to take all of this into account and really be strategic about your research dissemination and getting it, uh, being able to advocate with it. But just two quick things, I think the most major 
points that I picked up from all my reading is that A, you just need to understand policymaking theory. Um, there's so much change going about. We used to think of the policy cycle, which is like setting an agenda, doing an intervention, and then um, reviewing the effects of the intervention. And now we don't, need, don't really think of that as the most current model. Now we think of a policy environment. And so, i.e. like the environment surrounding health equity research, um, there's many different interventions going on at the same time. And so how does your research fit into that policy, that health, uh, health equity environment? Um, and then playing the long game is also really important. Becoming a trusted stakeholder in a specific niche is going to help your research go so much further than if you are this unknown researcher just trying to get their word out there. And so again, figuring out what level of government you want to impact and then trying to get those trying to get to know those key players and familiar familiarize uh, familiarize yourself with that. Um, so and again, there's a lot and uh, Laura, you can just click again. Um, we just encourage you to come back for workshop number three and we can go more in depth into all of these. Um, but I think we are running out of time. And so maybe I'll end here and ask if anyone has any questions. Yeah, questions could be about anything we talked about today at all or about our group in general. Um, if you wanna ask any questions, if you have something more specific that you don't think pertains to everyone and you wanna shoot one of us an email, I, I've listed all of our individual emails as well as our overall group email, which you can get any one of us at. So you can pop any questions in the chat um, or unmute yourself. We'd love to hear your voices, see your faces, et cetera. So um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Sorry if you already said this, but are we gonna send out the presentation, Lori? Or like the recording? Uh, we can send out the slides. Okay, just wondering. Should we end the recording and log out?